Carl watched as his stepdaughter walked toward the bus stop. It was just like any other day, until a gray car made a sudden U-turn on the road. And then Carl watched as his stepdaughter was forced into the car, and it sped away. Carl grabbed a bicycle from the yard and gave chase. But no matter his effort, it would be impossible for him to overtake the vehicle as it sped away. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. The crack of dawn seems especially early to young people who would rather sleep in than go to school. J.C. stirred from her slumber. It was Monday morning. She had to get up and get ready for school. Not quite yet. There was still some time before the alarm went off to summon the young 11-year-old girl into her day. J.C. could hear her mother moving around in the house, getting herself ready for her day. J.C. stayed there in her bed, slipping between the twilight feeling of sleep and being half awake. She was focused on being awake when her mother came into her room to give her a goodbye kiss. She knew this was going to happen because she had reminded her mom the night before. Mom, don't forget to give me a kiss goodbye in the morning, J.C. had told her mother. But as the young girl lay there in her bed, she heard the distinct sound of the home's front door closing. I guess J.C.'s mother, Terry Probin, had forgotten this last-minute request from her daughter. J.C. took this disappointment in stride and thought to herself, that's okay, I'll just give her a big hug and a kiss tonight and she told herself to remind her mother that she had forgotten. J.C. stayed there in her bed for a little while longer, until her alarm finally blared through her room, signaling her time to rise for the day. But just like most of us, J.C. hit that snooze button and laid there for an extra five minutes before hopping out of bed and greeting her day. J.C. got herself ready for school, The last thing she was looking for was her new ring she had just purchased at the craft fair the day prior. She did not have any luck locating the ring, so she settled for a ring her mother had bought her four years earlier for her seventh birthday, before she had met her new stepfather, Carl. J.C. did not care much for Carl, partly because he did not act like he cared much for her. J.C. felt like Carl was always mad at her, He always thought J.C. messed up everything. J.C. told herself that she needed to hurry up or she would miss the school bus, and that would upset Carl, because then he would have to drive her. So she put on the silver butterfly ring. It was small and delicate. It did not fit her finger properly anymore, so she wore it on her pinky finger. The butterfly shape matched J.C.'s birthmark on her arm, which is also in the shape of a butterfly. J.C. now donned a pair of pink stretch pants and her favorite kitty cat t-shirt. On top of this, she wore a pink windbreaker to stave off the cool air. It was Monday, June 10th, 1991. J.C. walked out of her bedroom and walked across the hall to take a peek in her new baby sister's room. This is where J.C. had spent her time the night before with her mom, folding laundry, and attempting to convince her that she deserved a new puppy. But J.C.'s mom just kept repeating the word no over and over. A house just down the street had new puppies, and J.C. would go over there every chance she got to pet the puppies through the fence. As she's making her final preparations to leave the house, J.C. experiences a small bout of nausea, and she briefly thinks about telling her new stepdad that she was sick and could not go to school. 
but she decided to save herself the argument with Carl and just go to school anyway. She went to the kitchen to make her breakfast and lunch. Breakfast would be instant oatmeal, but what flavor? JC decides on peaches and cream. As she throws the oatmeal in the microwave, she notices the clock says 6.30. She knows the bus will be here so soon, she better get a move on. She still needs to walk up the hill to the bus stop. She scarfs down the hot oats as quick as she can without burning her mouth. JC is thankful that Carl's not in the kitchen to witness this feeding frenzy. He already complained about JC's table manners at every meal. One time, he even made the girl eat her dinner sitting in the bathroom so she could stare at herself in the mirror as she ate. JC throws her peanut butter and jelly sandwich in her bag, along with an apple and a juice box. She walked back down the hall to see if her baby sister, Shayna, is awake yet. She's not. So no goodbye to baby sister today either. JC heads outside. She has to get up the hill to the bus stop. As she walks out onto the deck, JC sees her cat Monkey. Monkey is a black manx, so he has no tail. Monkey was primarily an outside cat, but most of the time he would come inside to sleep with JC overnight. JC is really pressed for time now, so she walks down her front stairs and makes her way down the long front walkway of their new home in Myers, California. The family had only lived in this house since September of last year. Before this, they had lived in Orange County. But after a break-in at their apartment, the couple decide to move their family to a smaller, safer town. So here they were. Typically, as J.C. made her way up the hill to the school bus stop, a neighborhood dog named Ninja would join her. But on this morning, Ninja did not show up. J.C. did not see her stepdad Carl anywhere in the house that morning, so she was assuming that maybe he was outside doing God knows what, and she blindly yelled goodbye to Carl as she made her way up the hill. One week of school is left, and then summer vacation. And JC was very excited because she was going to work on a dude ranch this summer with her good friend Shawnee. Shawnee was very experienced with horses and she had even taken JC on a trail ride before. One day, JC hopes she could ride as well as Shawnee. JC was also in the Girl Scouts. This was not her idea as JC was painfully shy and she could not even bring herself to talk when the girls went door-to-door selling cookies. The thing most on J.C.'s mind this morning was a school trip coming up this week to a water park. J.C. really, really wanted to go, but her body had just begun changing, and she was overly self-conscious. She had begun growing hair in her armpits and some on her legs. She wanted to talk to her mom about it, but... She was unsure how to bring up the topic. She had to build up the courage to have this talk soon, though. The trip was almost here, and she did not want to miss out. All the time that these thoughts ran around J.C.'s mind, she was still walking up the hill on this chilly June morning. As J.C. reaches the portion of the road where she must switch sides of the road, she begins crossing the road, daydreaming about the approaching summer. Her feet fall on the gravelly shoulder of the road. There are bushes now on the girl's left as she continues walking. Now on this side of the road, she can hear a car approaching. No other cars had passed by her yet this morning, and this car's sound cut through the quiet morning air as it got closer and closer to where J.C. was walking. The girl was still absentmindedly walking when the car pulled up behind her. A man leaned his head out of the car window and asked J.C. if she could help him with some directions. J.C. was a little taken aback about what was happening and did not quite register. But there was no time for anything to register, really, because when J.C. stood there listening to the man's question, but before she could respond, his hand shot out of the window. J.C. heard a crackling sound and she suddenly felt paralyzed. She had not even seen the taser in the man's hand. 
JC could hardly feel the hard, cold ground as she landed on her bottom. But her fear propelled her, and she began scooting her body backwards, away from the car and into the bushes which lined the street. She was just trying to get as far away from the man as she could. She needed the cover of the bushes. But as she began pushing herself into the bushes, another electrical jolt hit her, and she was suddenly being lifted from the ground by her limbs, which have suddenly stopped cooperating with her brain. J.C. realized that she had peed her pants out of fear or from the taser riddling her body with electricity. She could not be sure. But she was not embarrassed, and she began screaming, No! 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 The person throws the young girl into the floorboards of the back seat, and J.C.'s mind feels all fuzzy. All J.C. can think of is her baby sister, Shayna, kissing her mother goodbye. She wanted to go back home. All she wanted was a do-over for this morning. A blanket is thrown on top of the girl, and then she feels a weight pressing down on her, and she cannot move. The car is now moving again, and she can hear muffled voices, but she cannot tell what they're saying. It's, it's super hot under the blanket, and JC's mouth is very parched. She needs some water. And then, she loses consciousness. When JC wakes up, the car has stopped moving. The blanket is still on top of the girl, but the additional weight has been lifted. A car door opens, and then closes. And then the blanket is finally pulled back from JC's face. She can now see the man who had taken her, along with a woman. The man offers her a drink, which she takes. Suddenly, the man begins laughing out loud, and he says he could not believe they got away with it. J.C. just wants to go home. Who are these people, and what do they want with her? J.C. falls back asleep, and when she awakes, her head feels all spinny. She now notices that the car has stopped again. The man tells the other person in the car that they are home now, He then whispers something else, which J.C. cannot hear. The man tells J.C. to remain quiet and calm, or she will upset his very aggressive dogs. The man proceeds to cover the small, scared girl in a blanket, and then he walks her into the house. After entering the house, the man uncovers J.C., and she finally gets a good look at the man who has taken her from her life and her family. The man is tall. At least he seems tall to a scared 11-year-old girl. He has light blue eyes and brown hair, which is thinning on top. His skin is a bronze color, and his nose is a bit too long for his face. J.C. thought he looked like any other normal guy, but he was far from normal, and she already knew this. The man shows J.C. the stun gun he had used to subdue her, and he tells the girl that he will use it on her again if she were to try and escape. As J.C. is sitting on the sofa in the unkempt living room, she begins to notice copious amounts of cat hair coating the couch. As she looks around her surroundings, she notices a cat sitting on a washing machine. It looks like a Himalayan Persian, which was a calico color. J.C. asks the man if she can pet the cat, and he tells her that she can, if the cat willingly comes to her. One of the cats made its way over to the girl, and she pets its long, soft hair. This is now the only thing that feels real to this stolen girl. The man tells J.C. to follow him, which she does. What else could she do? She did not have anywhere to run, nowhere to hide. She didn't even know where she was. The pair arrived in the bathroom of the house. After they both walked into the room, the man turns and shuts the door, and then he locks it. J.C. can hear that the shower was already on, and then the man turns to her and tells her to take off her clothes. No, J.C. told the man. But the man responded by telling the girl that if she did not take off her clothes herself, 
then he would do it for her. Stunned, JC just stood there, and the man proceeded to remove all of her clothing. He then removed his own clothing, and JC looked at anything in the room other than this crazy man before her. The man asked her if she had ever seen a naked man, to which she responds, no. After forcing her to touch his private parts, he tells her to get into the shower and to begin washing up, and he gets into the shower with her. While in the shower, the man proceeds to shave all of the hair which had begun developing on the small girl. And while standing in the shower, silent tears began to stream down her face, mixing with the water pouring over her from the shower head. After exiting the shower and being wrapped in a towel, her silent tears turned into audible sobs, and the man seems taken aback from this reaction. He tells her not to worry. He was not going to do anything more to her tonight. The Secret Sits will return in just a moment. Welcome to the Mojo for Musicians podcast from Manny Cabo Media, where we dig deep into today's top strategies to help you take your music career to the next level, along with real, raw, and uplifting conversations with industry professionals that are making moves, making a difference, and making the best versions of themselves to inspire you to do the same. And for all of our Mojo Maniacs out there, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you like what you hear, please be sure to give us a positive review on your favorite listening platform. The man leads the girl, now wrapped only in her bath towel, down a small flight of stairs and out to the downstairs porch. He once again covers her head with the same blanket from the car. All of her stuff is now gone. Her backpack, shoes, and her clothes. She is only left with her small butterfly ring, which she assumes the man has yet to notice. Now covered in a blanket and walking blindly outside, like a ghost who forgot to cut the eye holes out of its sheet. She can feel the cool concrete under her feet and then this gives way to cool, damp grass. The man guides her by holding the back of her neck. She can hear a train going by somewhere close. This is the first mental note JC makes about her location. Suddenly, there are sticks and sharp rocks for her to step on, which really hurt her feet. Then cold concrete again. JC hears a gate being pushed open and then closed once they walk past it. They continue walking, and as they do, JC begins questioning where the other person from the car went. Then the man tells her to step up. As she lifts her leg and places it back down, she can now feel carpet under her foot, and she hears a door close behind her. The man removes the blanket from her head, and she can see she is in a small room with a pile of blankets on the floor. The man tells JC that he is going to leave her there, but because he does not trust her yet, he needs to put some handcuffs on her. She tells the man that she will not try to get away, but he tells her that he has to. The cuffs he produces have faux fur covering them. He tells JC that they will be more comfortable than regular handcuffs. He then puts the small girl's hands behind her back, and cuffs her. He then lays her down on her side and leaves the room. As the man leaves, she can hear the lock being placed on the outside of the door, and then JC laid handcuffed on the ground and cried herself to sleep. The next morning, JC is awake, and the small room is beginning to quickly heat up in the morning sun. It grew so hot that she already was sweating from the ambient heat in the room. Then she can hear the rattle of the lock on the outside of the door, and the young girl knew her mysterious captor was returning. The man brought her fast food to eat. He would remove the cuffs for her to be able to eat, which was a relief, and this made JC actually look forward to when the man would show up. 
The man would attempt to entertain his captive by doing silly voices and bad accents. This man was JC's only form of human contact. And apart from the shower incident, the man had not even attempted to touch the girl again. At least not for the first week and a half. The man returns to the room, and JC can hear as he walks in. The door opens, and the man has brought a milkshake for her. He bends down and tells the girl that today is going to be a little different. Today, she can have the milkshake, but she cannot have food until after. After what? JC thinks to herself, and all of a sudden, she's not very hungry anymore. This was the first time that the man would rape the young 11-year-old JC Dugard. She did not understand what was happening. She did not understand what sex even was. And she certainly did not know what rape was. That word was not even in her vocabulary yet. But it happened, and it made her bleed. The man left her a bucket of water and a washcloth to clean herself up as he waited in the next room. This would be the life JC would grow to know. This man would visit her, and if he did not rape her on his visit, he would treat her kindly. JC eventually grew to enjoy the man's company. Perhaps this was the young girl's naivete, or it was just her loneliness. But she was locked in this room for days on end, and the man was her only contact with the outside world. All she could do at this point was survive and endure. After some time, the man told JC that he would get her a kitten. By this time, she was no longer required to wear the handcuffs, and she could move around her room freely. But she was bored. There was nothing to do all day long in this room. The man had installed an air conditioning unit, so it was not getting so hot in the room. JC began to notice that she could hear things quite clearly with no other distractions from the outside world. She could even hear when the man approached her room from the outside. She could tell he was there even before he began unlocking the door. After the man has left JC alone again, she attempts to muster up the courage to explore the rooms attached to hers. She quietly opened the door to the next room. It looked very dark and creepy. There were no windows. As her eyes adjusted to the pitch blackness, she can begin to make things out in the room. There was a drum set and a microphone stand and a set of huge speakers. JC had no interest in knowing her captor's name. She figured if she knew his name, that meant he would never let her go. But as much as she did not want to know, as time wore on, she would come to know the man's name was Philip. It made sense to JC that the music equipment was there. She knew Philip was a musician, and he had occasionally brought his acoustic guitar to her room, and he had sung her some songs. Philip told her that he was a very talented musician, and one day he would be famous. But she did not care. She just wanted to go home. While JC's courage was at an all-time high, and she continued to explore her place of confinement, she thought, what if I pushed on the big door that led outside? What if it opened? Philip had told her that the Dobermans were still outside, and they would consider her an intruder because they did not know her. She did not want to get attacked by the dogs. But she pushed on the door, but it did not move. Philip brought an old black and white TV to JC's room. It did not get very good reception, and during the day it was kind of useless. But at night, she could pick up some infomercials or QVC, which was better than nothing. JC began to recognize Philip's pattern of movement. He usually came to see her early in the mornings and then late in the evenings after the sun had set. This evening, when Philip arrived, he unlocked the door and then told the girl to close her eyes. She does, as she is told. And when he tells her to open her eyes, there he stood, holding a brand new kitten. JC was so happy. 
The kitten was gray with stripes, like a tiger running down its back. And so she decided to name her Ticker, after the persistently happy tiger from Winnie the Pooh. Philip provides a litter box and some food and water for the cat. He then tells JC that he has to take Nancy to work. JC did not know who Nancy was. She eventually found out that Nancy was Philip's wife. She had been the other person in the car with him on the day when she was taken, a day that seems so long ago already. Philip left and JC began to wonder if she would ever get to meet Nancy. She wanted to meet her. She was so lonely, she wanted to meet anyone. She hoped that maybe one day, Nancy would stop by and visit her too. As JC sat in her room playing with her new kitten, she began wondering if she had already missed her class trip to the water park. She wondered if it was fun, and she wondered what her friend Shawnee was doing right now. A small room is no place to raise a kitten. There's nothing to enrich the cat, and so it acts out. Tigger began to urinate all around the room, and the smell of cat urine clung to the air. When Philip came to visit, he could not stand the smell, so he decided that Tigger had to go. Philip came to take the cat away, and somehow JC understood. This was not a proper environment for a baby cat, but she was sad just the same. Philip told her that he would take the kitten to his aunt's house. She loved cats and would take care of it. She shouldn't cry. JC spent a lot of her time sleeping. When she was asleep, she could be anywhere she wanted to be, and anywhere was better than here. In the middle of the night, the lock on the outside of the door began to rattle. The sound woke her from her dream. This was much later than Philip normally came by. JC hoped that he was not here for sex, and she squeezed her eyes shut tight, pretending to be asleep. But she could still feel the man as he crouched down beside her. He placed his hand on her shoulder and shook her awake. It's time to wake up. We are going next door, Philip said. And then he put a blanket over her head. JC had been completely nude while in this one room. She was not sure how many days she had been there yet. She had not figured out an accurate way to keep track of the days. But one day, Philip showed up with a flower-printed one-piece jumpsuit and a pair of underwear. And this became the girl's new favorite thing, clothes. Philip led her out of the door into the night air. This was her first time out of this room since she had arrived. They only took about 10 steps before Philip said, We are here. Philip removed the blanket and JC saw where they had arrived. This was a new room. It had three windows, one on each side wall and one next to the door. The back wall had no window, but there was an AC unit there. JC notices that there are bars on the outside of the windows, and then Philip moved to cover the windows up with towels, just like in her old room. In the center of the room, there's a blue couch. It acts like a divider, making the room feel as if it's two rooms. There's also a TV on a stand and a small refrigerator with some storage space just underneath it. In the corner, there is a bucket toilet. JC was scared of this new place. At least in her old room, she knew the routine. She knew what to expect. Here, everything was strange and new and frightening all over again. Philip proceeds to tell JC that he was going to go on a run. She did not understand what the man was talking about because she knew he did not mean he was going to put on tinny shoes and go running outside. Philip then proceeded to explain to her that a run was when he would do as much crank as he possibly could and that it would allow him to stay awake and fulfill all of his fantasies and that it was her job to help him fulfill those fantasies. As he began doing his drugs, he made the 11-year-old clean herself with the bucket of water 
And then he dressed her up in tight-fitting clothes and made her put on makeup. Philip begins smoking his crank and offers some to JC. She says no. She thinks drugs are gross. Philip then rolls a blunt and continues on his bender. JC went through a lot on this night, and she just kept thinking, once he is done, he'll become nice Philip again, the Philip who makes her laugh and brings her fast food to eat. Philip finishes his rampage of drugs and rape, and when he is done, he takes his young helpless victim back to the studio building to sleep. The building JC was being housed in was referred to as the studio, and the other building where Philip would take JC for his runs was called Next Door. After a few of these drug-filled sessions, Philip decided to allow JC to stay permanently in Next Door. The girl really appreciated this. Here she had a good TV, and she could watch whatever she wanted. Philip has also begun calling the girl Snoopy. When she asked where the nickname came from, he told her it was because she asked a lot of questions all of the time, and he could tell she'd been snooping through his things since she moved into next door. Here in the next door, JC could look out of the windows, even though they are still covered in towels. There's not much to see outside besides plants, but she can see the studio building. It is a small brown shed with lots of wires running to it. JC likes next door much better. The next time Philip shows up to see JC, he tells her that he had brought someone to meet her. And standing just behind the man is a short woman who he introduces as his wife, Nancy. Philip informs JC that Nancy will be bringing her her meals now and that she needs to be patient with Nancy because she's still a bit jealous of the girl. JC typically slept on the pull-out bed. The blue couch in the middle of the room was a sleeper sofa. But sometimes Philip and Nancy would sleep in the room with JC. And when they did, they took the hideaway bed and JC slept on a pallet on the floor. The couple had gotten a Nintendo for JC, which she loved because it gave her something to do. One day, Nancy came to visit her, and she brought her a stuffed teddy bear. She told JC that she had been looking for the perfect one for quite a while. She handed the girl the soft and squishy purple bear, and JC named him Nurple Bear. As Nancy spent more time with their captive, she told JC more about herself. For example, she told her that she worked in a convalescence home, taking care of old people, and that she had a favorite patient, an old Italian man named Mr. Giovetti. And this is how life progressed for JC. She had now been held in captivity for a little over a year, and Philip and Nancy would quite often come to spend time with JC in the next door. They brought fast food and would rent movies. JC specifically remembers watching A Nightmare on Elm Street and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and really liking those. JC has now endured over a year held in captivity, with no running water, and Philip raping her any time he felt like it. JC sometimes enjoyed Nancy's company, but the woman had terrible mood swings, probably brought on by her jealousy of JC, her husband's new young plaything and he had no plans of getting rid of this girl anytime soon. Join us next week as JC enters her second year in captivity. We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Lay.